Hi, welcome back to the second part in the uh, series on tuning SQL Server. In the first part, we had discussed the data model that we'll be working with, which is essentially a website that would be uh, storing data regarding ticket bookings. So you could essentially just go and uh, plug it into a website and browse the flights available, things like that. Uh, I will be providing a link to the first video uh, here as well so that you can refer to it. Uh, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to continue that discussion in terms of uh, looking at the code that will be uh, executed to simulate the kind of issues that we might encounter in a real-world scenario. Uh, the plan initially was to go ahead and show you the actual code, but I uh, figured that better than show you the code, it would be good if we could just go ahead and look at the impact that the code has on the uh, execution rather than simulate, uh, look at the code and then figure out what's wrong because that would give us some information that would kind of bias us towards a particular troubleshooting step. Initially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and quickly show you what we're trying to do with these uh, procedures just so that you understand the business process that's being modeled here and then we'll run them to simulate maybe a hundred users connecting to the system and running the queries and we'll see the kind of impact that has on the system. As of right now, none of the tables have uh, any index other than a clustered index, uh, which is kind of like a best practice. Ideally, every table should have a primary key. So uh, with only that index, we're just going to run the procedures and see what kind of behavior we, we get out of it. Uh, so the procedures that we have here is we've got one procedure here, which is to simulate logins, which will be basically you enter a username and password and it checks against the database to see whether that user exists. Uh, the second one is basically just searching flights, so you could type in a origin airport and a destination airport and a date and it'll tell you which flights are available and what the price of those flights would be. Uh, reset booking and schedule is just basically something I've written so I can reset everything back to the initial state whenever I finish these demos. Uh, report is a, date, uh, is a table that I've created specifically to go ahead and show you uh, what the impact of very large tables would be. So these, these tables usually have roughly around 2 million rows. Again, we could have 15, 20 million rows, but since I'm doing it on my laptop, I don't have the kind of space needed to do that. So I'm sticking to just about 2, 2.5 million rows here, and we'll see how uh, performance differs between smaller tables versus larger tables in an ODS kind of environment. I've also gone ahead and created some DBA tasks, mainly because I want to go ahead and show you how a developer's work might interfere with the DBA's activities as well as vice versa. So a DBA could be taking a backup, updating a statistic or rebuilding indexes while users are still connected to the system. And we want to see the relationship between these two uh, activities and how they interfere with each other. These are the most important procedures that we'll be running quite frequently along with search flights. Uh, the reason is because if you look at book flights, it's basically like a shopping cart where you're browsing and you're just checking things out but you're not yet ready to go ahead and commit and make a payment. So temporarily we store some of the information inside this book flights table. And then we have the confirm booking which is a procedure that would uh, essentially take an entry from book flights and say yeah okay so this is the one that you want to go ahead and process and we'll start deducting amounts from your wallet as well as confirm the booking as well as deduct one seat from the total capacity of the plane so that we don't overbook flights things like that and the last one is the complete flow where we kind of do all of these things in a hierarchy where you'll start off by logging in searching for a flight booking a flight and then confirming the flight and these are the procedures so you can see that we've got some select statements in terms of uh, just browsing which is basically search flights and then we've got also some insert and update statements inside confirm booking book flights etc so this will give us the kind of issues that we might encounter with a read versus write concurrency issue uh, to kind of simulate this without having to go ahead and actually run these code multiple times i've gone ahead and used os stress which is a tool that's available in rml utilities you can go ahead and just call any procedure and it'll simulate X number of users and X number of requests for that procedure. So if you look over here, what I'm doing is I'm basically logged into my database and I'm saying that run the procedure search flights, which is under the hyphen Q switch, and I'm saying use Windows authentication and simulate 100 users connected to the system. Uh, so we'll have 100 connections. I'll go ahead and show you that in a minute. And then I'm going to say that each connection is going to execute this procedure five times. Uh, so I'm expecting roughly about 500 uh, sessions, uh, 500 times the query should execute. 
and just to give you an idea about this I'm gonna run it right now and while it's doing that I'll just quickly go ahead and show you how this would look if I opened up the DMV SysDM or sorry exec exec underscore connections and if you look over here you'll see that uh, I've got now 100 and nine connections obviously some of them are already uh, sessions that I've created before and this simulates that 100 users are connected to the system right now and to kind of just take it further I'll show you what the DMV would look like for system exec requests the intention with these videos is not to assume that you already have some very good knowledge about SQL Server but to help you understand how you should start troubleshooting as a beginner you can already see that a lot of these queries are running and we'll see that they got a lot of runnable states as well as suspended which automatically indicates to me that there is some kind of CPU related pressure you'll also see that the wait types here are showing CX packets which indicates parallelism so uh, I don't want to go ahead and get into that discussion here with these videos I want to kind of assume that you don't really know how to troubleshoot SQL Server you're a developer and uh, you write the code and typically the mentality is yeah if the procedure is getting the input and giving the output and it works fine on my laptop I'm happy and that's where we are and I want to show th how that could be improved upon by understanding the indexing and other aspects of it so I've already got this procedure it's running uh, is running in the background you can see that sometimes it returns zero results sometimes it returns different rows it's, it's actually pretty random in the way that it goes about fetching data and uh, to show you the impact of this what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and use activity monitor which is a thing that I expect most developers would be aware of so uh, a typical thing that I see is someone who's like maybe a year or two into SQL Server usually starts their troubleshooting with activity monitor to kind of understand if uh, there's a problem with their SQL Server instance uh, as you can see here right now my OS stress utility is working and uh, I've got a video as well as a blog available which shows you how to use this tool and you can use that to kind of uh, understand what the parameters are and how this works so definitely go ahead check that out once you're done with this one and right off the bat we can see that this particular query that we have here is definitely CPU intensive and that gives us an idea that there is something wrong with the procedure which is causing the CPU to blow up typically in a real-world production environment you would normally just see this without really knowing which procedure is causing the issue and that's what I want to show you uh, you here as well because I know that I'm running the procedure search flights which is uh, what I passed as the input here but assuming that you didn't know that you probably start your troubleshooting by coming over here and looking at uh, this particular um, uh, activity monitor and one of the stuff that we can see clearly here is that we've got batch requests it's um, not really all that great so we definitely have some kind of concurrency issues going on here as well but as far as IO activity is concerned you'll see that there's hardly any database IO happening and one of the reasons is because I've just restarted my system and my RAM is pretty much free and whatever data is required by this procedure is already there in the RAM so there's really not all that much IO activity happening at the moment we'll see this change significantly once I start doing DML operations as well and as of right now there doesn't seem to be any waiting task which usually would mean that oh, well if there is no waiting task everything seems to be working fine that shouldn't really be a performance issue and I would not necessarily agree with that because even though we don't have waiting tasks here we can clearly see that there is some CPU related problems that we're facing and if you look right now this particular query is finished executing it's finished uh, 100 into uh, 5 so we've got uh, 500 executions completed in 3 point uh, 3 minutes and 6 seconds not all that great and while it was doing that you can see that my CPU is pretty high and even though there are no waiting tasks that's de definitely not something that we want to encounter in the next video I'm going to show you how to fix this I hope that uh, you understand what we're trying to do here by calling procedures simulating millions of users and seeing the impact that they have on CPU memory IO well uh, thank you for watching this video and uh, stay tuned for the next one where we will show you how to fix this I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching